Right, well, welcome everybody to uh, my spring talk, uh, Photography of Moving Water. I'm Nigel Hicks, a professional photographer living in the southwest of England, in Devon, in fact. And as I say, I'm going to talk about the photography of moving water this evening. Um, working out how best to photograph water is always a little bit of an issue problem, really, because obviously when you're actually with the water in, in, in the place, it's very dynamic environment everything's moving it's a lots of energy it's, it's, it's lots of often quite a bit quite a feeling of power and then you take a photograph and everything stops dead and in the final picture it's just lifeless it can be lifeless and, and everything's completely static of course all that energy all that movement is completely gone um so you really need to try to find ways to uh compensate for that and actually help try and put that feeling of movement and energy and dynamism back into your picture and so there's two main ways of trying to do that, really. The first is actually uh, freezing the movement of the water. And the other way is at the other extreme of blurring the movement of the water. So in other words, if you're trying to freeze the movement of the water, you are going to use a fast shutter speed. Obviously, that's what you need to actually freeze that movement and just keep, uh, keep it static. And if you're going to blur the movement of the water, then that's going to the opposite extreme and using a very slow shutter speed so that the water just blurs out. And they have different uses in different different situations. And um, certainly for, for me, my personal preference is most of the time to blur the movement of water, as we have in this introductory shot. Here we've got two lots of blur. Here you've got the stream coming across the beach is all blurred out. And then you've got the sea itself is, is blurred as well and taken uh, at, at dusk one, one evening. Uh, when it's uh, light, light levels alone, it's easy to use a very slow shutter speed. Of course, there are times when, uh, in the middle of the day, when there's way too much light to use a really slow shutter speed, and then blurring does become a, a bit more of a technique, a bit more of a skill. Uh, and then when it comes to using a fast shutter speed to freeze the movement of the water, very often people don't do it very well. They do use a shutter speed that's perhaps too slow. Uh, and not, not fast enough to freeze the movement of the water. That, that, that's often because uh, the, uh, sh the, the water is moving a lot faster than people realize. And also tend to, people tend to zoom out too far. So I'll show the next picture, which shows you sort of the, the typical sort of pictures you might take with a, um, a fast shutter speed, but shooting a wide view. This is taken a, on a day in West Cornwall when the waves were uh, rolling in, it was it, it was not exactly stormy, but the waves were, were were quite big. But using a wide angle lens, you don't really capture a sense of of the, the power of the waves, or the size of the waves, or the speed they're moving at, or anything like that. And um, it's a nice enough picture, but it doesn't really, for me anyway, it doesn't really grab the energy and show the dynamism and and, the, and power of that of of the of this scene that we had here. For me, most of the time when you're using using a fast shutter speed to try to freeze the movement of the water, you you need to really use a telephoto lens, lens and zoom in close, such as with this shot. This is taken in the same location, same day, same time, just a, a few minutes earlier, actually, than that last shot. You just using a sort of three or 400 millimeter lens and coming in really, really close and using shutter speed. I've got my notes here. It says 800th of a second is the shutter speed you're using. And you, you can see in the droplets here that we've really just about managed to use a shutter speed that's fast enough to freeze the movement. And here we actually really get the feeling of the energy and the power of the wave with all these droplets flying all over the place. When you use a wide angle lens, you're just too far away from the wave to really get the feeling of that movement to really, or to really see those, those, those droplets and that spray. And when you use a shutter speed that's too slow, it's a, the standard shutter speed that most people use most of the time, like a 60th of a second or 125th of a second. It's just too slow to really freeze the movement of, 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 the, of these uh, of, the, of this spray, and, and it all comes out a little bit blurred. But if you go up to something pretty fast, then you can do that. Obviously, how fast a shutter speed you need to use depends very much on how fast the water is moving. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to demonstrate that in the coming, coming images to show you that the shutter speed you need does vary enormously, both, both for fast shutter speed to freeze the movement of the water and also for, for a slow shutter speed to blur the movement of the water. It does depend an awful lot on just how, how fast the water is moving. So in this shot, it's, um, well, we can use a fast shutter speed because we've got a lot of sunlight, which, which um, is not always the case, of course. 
And but having a lot of sunlight does create problems because you had a lot of white light here, which can burn out, and then you have deep shadows down here. This image did actually require a certain amount of work to dampen down this bright highlight and, and lighten up the, the deep shadows down here. So it did require a little bit of post photography processing to, to, to try and balance the picture up a bit. But the bright light did at least enable me to use a, a fast shutter speed. Um, the lens aperture, by the way, was 7.1, so the shutter, uh, so the lens aperture is reasonably wide open, but it did ena enable me to use quite a fast shutter speed to really freeze up that water. On a similar vein, this is a, 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 a same kind of idea, a much bigger wave than in that la last picture, moving much faster, I think. And uh, well, actually, the shutter speed is 500th of a second, so I guess it's moving about the same speed. But again, it's in taken in bright sunlight. But with the, with the sun shining kind of from top left, and you can see they've got this white this arc of white water here. And to stop that white water burning out in the sunlight, I had to underexpose the image by quite a bit. As you can, you might be able to tell from up here, this is actually a blue sky. You can see just how dark it is. That with um, it's actually supposed to be a blue sky, but it, the image is un, un, underexposed by that stop or stop and a half, and the sky has come out quite uh, quite dark as a result. But at least we've now managed to get this this white water not burning out. Five hundredths of a second to actually really capture the movement of, of this wave, really capture the and freeze freeze the movement and really capture the spray. So this is the kind of scenario where using a fast shutter speed and to freeze the movement can really work. It's where you come in close on your subject to photograph a large wave. If you stand, uh, stand a long way back, what I often see with people photographing waves hitting sea walls, and I've done it myself as well, you have a wave crashing over a sea wall, you take a great picture, and it looks like a fantastically big wave in real life. When the picture comes out, the wave looks tiny and it looks to be miles away. It's because you really have to home in very, very close with this kind of uh, scene to actually really capture the power and the movement and the energy of, of that wave. So that really the picture, you're not able to capture the general landscape, you really are photographing just that wave. So something a little bit different shot on a day on the west coast of Iceland when the when it's not so sunny. It's bright, but it's not really sunny. But we've got bright white water against these dark volcanic cliffs. So we've got a strong contrast. But again, uh, there's enough light to use fast shutter speed. It's at 640th of a second. And the lens aperture is f7.1, so the lens is fairly wide open. Um, and I've had to put the ISO up a little bit, just only to 200, so not so not too far. But it's just in order to be able to use that fast shutter speed, uh, in order to freeze up moving water, uh, it, it, it's, I had to sort of uh, put the ISO up, which is something I don't like to do very often, but it's something it will do when light levels are low, when you've really got to, to, to go use a fast shutter speed to freeze. Uh, fast action. Obviously, um, uh, well, one, one, I could have put the camera on a tripod here, and uh, perhaps to actually uh, enable me to be, to not have to use quite such a, or not, not have to put the ISO up at all. But uh, it was actually a fairly windy day, so I think uh, it was probably better to handhold and use a really fast shutter speed if I possibly could. And uh, as you can see, I mean, obviously the waves hitting the cliff, they wait when the waves come into the cliff, they're moving quite fast. But when the spray shoots up in the air, at some point the spray is moving quite slowly as it gets to the, the summit of how high it's going to go. So hopefully then you don't need to use quite a fast shutter speed. But I opted not to not to chance that and just to use a fast shutter speed, 640 of a second. Uh, Say so it's not bright sunlight, which is actually a little bit of a help, really, because it decreases the contrast between the black lava cliffs and the white water. I think it would be very hard. If it was really sunny, it would be very hard to stop this white water burning out. It would be very hard to stop this black lava going into deep, deep shadow. But uh, on, a, on a less bright day, or sort of cloudy day, overcast day, the light levels are a little bit e easier to control. OK, so so far I've told you to uh, you have to zoom in and photograph really big waves, just concentrate on just the big waves. But actually, of course, that's not entirely true. There are situations where you can use very small waves as well. But that's, again, still coming in really close and really concentrating on just creating a pattern, I suppose, and creating a mood and an atmosphere. And here we just have a little bit of foam 
sliding up the, up the beach from, from small waves lapping on the sand and backlit by the setting sun. So but quite strong light, but really just using a fast shutter speed just to freeze the movement of, of the water coming up the beach. Of course, as the water, as this foam, the water reaches the top of its climb up the beach, then it will actually be moving quite slowly. And you don't necessarily need to use that faster shutter speed, which in this kind of image is probably just as well, because of course we're looking along the beach. And we've got quite a big depth here. So we, and we need to have it all sharp, all the way from just in front of me here, all the way to the back here. It needs to be quite sharp, which means we need a big depth of field. That is, we need all the image sharp, big depth of field. That means a, a narrow lens aperture. And so in this picture, I've, uh, I've concentrated less on the shutter speed and more on the lens aperture. So this is f18 lens aperture, so giving me a big depth of field. And the shutter speed is 160th of the second. So still a relatively fast shutter speed, but not like the ones I've, images I've shown you up to now. Much slower, but that's big, but that's because A, I need a big depth of field, and also because the water is moving much more slowly, and we end up with a very atmospheric image, but concentrating on, on really what is just a, a detail once again. Or you can go a little bit further than this, and you become quite a great abstract patterns. And this is actually looking straight down off the top of a cliff uh, onto a beach in Cornwall, and just at the last of the, of the wave as they, as they creep up the beach. Again, certainly when you get to the top, top of the seas rise onto the sh on, on the shore the water's moving quite slowly down here the waves are moving rather rather faster but still not that all that fast um, so i don't need to use a hugely fast shutter speed however on this image i don't also don't need to have a huge um, depth of field because i'm shooting almost almost directly straight down and so most of the image most most parts of the image are pretty much the same distance away from me there's no, no great long view here which uh, with things much further away than others most most of the material here is actually pretty much the same distance from from the camera so haven't had to use a really big uh, um, f number here actually the lens aperture is just f8 so it's reasonably well open and i and the shutter speed is actually quite fast it's 640 per second not really needed to it's partly because i use the telephoto lens of course to home in on the detail here so uh, the, the focal length of the lens is 170 millimeters so not a big telephoto lens, but, uh, but uh, reasonably strong enough to actually want to use a fairly fast shutter speed, but not uh, not as fast as I have actually used here. But just uh, just making sure we're concentrating on just creating this abstract pattern. Same kind of thing. This is actually taken with a drone, so I'm really looking. I'm looking directly down from from uh, the, the from the drone here, and here actually the. the the lens is wide open. It's f two point eight because that's fixed on this on this uh, make of drone. So uh, just f two point eight, which with it's a very wide angle lens, equivalent to twenty four millimeter. And I've used it's it's used just a, a sixtieth of a second, so quite a slow shutter speed. And that's because it's really just literally a few minutes before sunset. So light levels are starting to get quite low. And actually, you can see these waves are not particularly big on I mean, it it's, you can't really judge the size of the waves in this shot but you can probably guess they're not all that big and you can see the size of the shadow ahead of the wave so the sun is coming sort of from the right of the picture and you can see you've got quite strong shadows quite long shadows riding in front of the waves so the light levels are getting to be quite low so only 60 of a second even with the lens aperture f2.8 but again as i say using small waves just pack, pick, picking out the detail and creating an abstract pattern of the waves rolling around a sandbar on the South Devon coast. Um, of course, the whole thing becomes rather different when you get to a point where you are actually getting people into the picture. You're really going to use a fast shutter speed. It not all, not most of the time, you're not going to want to blur the movement of people. So you're not going to use a slow shutter speed to blur them or blur, blur the water. So uh, there, are, there are a few instances where you might do that. But a lot of the most of the time, if you've got people in the shot, you're going to use a fairly sharp, fast shutter speed to, to have them sharp. And so, of course, then you get uh, sharp water as well. Small waves, though, so nothing really much. is come looking very spectacular. It's very calm. It's really a, a sort of a, a summery holiday kind of landscape picture just of uh, just, just showing people want, with, with the beach. It's kind of not the sort of the atmospheric landscape shot that you might normally expect. But if you're photographing um, 
holidays in Cornwall for a brochure, a magazine, or a book. This is exactly the kind of thing you might shoot. And then if it's coming really close, then of course it's not really any, not really about the wave anymore, about the moving water anymore. It's really about the person. And it, with this kind of thing, 400 millimeter lens, you're really going to use a very fast shutter speed to blur, to, to freeze, sorry, to freeze the movement of, of the, uh, of the, the, um, of, of the surfer here. And actually, the shutter speed is 500 per second, and the shutter and lens aperture is f10. But um, using 400 millimeter lens, depth of field is quite small. The waves, the background, or the sea in the background is quite blurred. And actually, even the spray coming behind the surfer, behind the windsurfer, is actually a little bit blurred as well. So it's not completely frozen. The movement of the, of the surfer here is not completely frozen, but the movement of the surfer is. So really moving away from uh, landscape photography of the moving water and instead of sports photography of the moving windsurfer. So that's kind of so summarized my my ideas about using fast shutter speeds when photographing moving water, mostly without people, but occasionally with them, of course. Now we're going to start moving on and talking about uh, blurred, um, blurring the movement of the water, which is, I actually have to say, is, is my favorite. Uh, I'm, Quite happy about that. Obviously, this is not a blurred movement, but I'm just going to show you a couple of comparison shots uh, initially. Uh, sort of an autumn day on the North Devon coast. It's uh, stormy ish, but not actually really stormy, but it's the, the lights is getting a little bit stormy. The sunlight is uh, a, lot, a lot of a heavy cloud, but there's some sunlight shining just on more or less just on the building and the hill behind it. Everything else is more or less in shadow, and the sea is looking really churned up, which is giving us a nice. Uh, giving us the atmosphere and the feeling of, of, of energy and movement and power, uh, which is quite, quite in itself quite atmospheric. But then if you use a really slow shutter speed and blur it out, then it becomes quite a different image. In some many senses, it's quite stormy, but also it's actually quite ethereal and quite calming, and quite, quite peaceful. I have noticed actually that the overall exposure is a little bit lighter in this picture than in the previous shot. If you compare it, that, that those cliffs are a lot darker there than in, in this image. So perhaps I should to make a direct strict comparison, I probably should have darkened this a little bit. But um, I think you can see it's a very different image. Of course, it's taken in daylight, even though it's a little bit stormy, light levels, generally speaking, are too high to use a shutter speed that is slow enough to blur the water to this extent. Now, this is actually quite extensively blurred. So how do you get a really slow shutter speed in the middle of the day when light levels are not especially bright, but they are there and we do have a little bit of sunlight? Well, of course, you use a neutral density filter, an ND filter, you put over the over the front of the lens, and that really cuts down the amount of light getting into the uh, in, into the camera. On this shot, the shutter speed was 400th of a second at f4, so the lens aperture was wide open. Um, and I had to open it wide out to just just to get enough um, to be able to use a fast enough shutter speed to really be sure of freezing the movement of those waves. In this image, it's f18, so I really close the lens aperture down, uh, and the exposure is six seconds. But to get it that slow, I've had to use an ND filter on the on the camera as well. Um, couldn't get a slow slow enough shutter speed simply by closing the lens aperture right down. That, that just wasn't possible. But uh, to get down to this kind of blur, really needed to use a long six seconds exposure. And the only way to do that was to use an ND filter, which obviously is a dark filter, you just put on the front of the lens. And that really um, slows the shutter speed right down, really reduces the amount of light getting into, into your into your sensor. sensor. Obviously, um, it's not always that easy to see what you're doing once you've got a, a dense filter on the front of the lens. So you try to line your picture up first and then put the filter on. And the exposure meter, um, it works reasonably well through the um, filter. I do often find that the, the picture does come out a little bit underexposed if I uh, just use the, the, the actual light setting that the exposure meter uh, finds. But uh, so often I have to overexpose a little bit, which obviously further increases the, the, shutter, the, the exposure time. Let's move on to a couple more comparison shots. And here we have a shot on the south coast of Iceland. Uh, really a lot of sunlight, as you can see him shooting straight into the sun. Fast shutter speed. It's oh, actually not that fast, 80th of a second. So it's a fairly sort of standard wide angle view. 
f f22 so the lens aperture is closed down as far as it, I, I could go on this particular lens and i've used a neutral density graduated filter when it comes to this so graduated in the sense that it darkens just the top half of the picture because obviously the top half is very very bright with the sun here and helps to lighten the lower half the cliffs are still horribly dense but uh, nevertheless the, the sea and the, the, sorry, the sea and the sky are reasonably well balanced so we've got a, an interesting composition here with a fast shutter speed compare it to this one which has an, N, an nd a neutral density filter and a neutral density graduated filter on the front and you can see that uh, the, the waves are really blurred out much more it's not that fast a shutter speed still it's two seconds f22 so uh it's still incredibly bright despite having a, a neutral density filter on the, on the front of the lens. Uh, but it's still a very different kind of image from the previous shot. Do actually have a slightly less sunlight this time because the sun has gone partially behind a cloud in the, in the couple of minutes that passed since the previous shot, but which helps to reduce the glare a little bit. But it also, and also reduces the light level slightly, so I get a slightly longer exposure. And the water is, is, is well blurred out, not as blurred out as you might expect, but it's, uh, you, can see the, you can still see the waves over here. Now we're actually going to move in, inland just for a moment, just have a little uh, short comparison. With, I've obviously been showing you all uh, marine images so far of the sea. Now we're going to come onto a, a, a woodland stream and come in pretty close on the detail. And when you're photographing a woodland stream like this, the water is moving very fast, probably faster than the sea very often. And also, because you're coming in close, the water is moving across a much larger percentage of, of the image frame than it is on a, in a view, on a, in a wide angle view taken out of the sea. So, so that is, it has a much smaller uh, arc of movement, you might say, across the image, image frame on a wide angle view of the sea. But if you're taking a close up detail view, then the water is moving across a much bigger proportion of the image view. So that means that, you, that you, to, to freeze its movement, you would need to have a much, much faster shutter speed. And to blur it, it becomes a lot easier because you don't need to use such a long exposure. This is a, a quarter of a second at f22, taken on a, on a fairly, on, on an overcast day. I don't know if it's necessarily particularly dull, but on an overcast day. So it enables me, even though it's the middle of the day, it enables, enables me to get a slow enough shutter speed to actually get a reasonable blur. F22 means it's got a big depth of field, so it's it, it's reasonably sharp all the way to the back, although of course it's hard to, to judge that because the water is blurred anyway. But if you look at the next shot, it's exactly the same image, same, exactly the same frame, I should say, um, shots with a very fast shutter speed. This is a thousandth of a second, and see we just about managed to freeze the movement of the water okay. And it's at F5, so the lens aperture is quite wide open. Uh, but you know, in the background, the depth shows that the depth of field is not that great. It's starting to blur out. But we've managed to freeze the movement of the water OK, it's looking all right. But um, a thousandth of a second on an overcast day, it was a lens aperture f5. That, that inevitably means that I've had to put the, the ISO up, the sensor sensitivity, and that's at 1250 for this particular picture. So it's become a little bit grainy. Uh, it's not something I. I like to do because the picture the scene does come a little bit grainy but it's not that bad um 1250 iso on cameras these days is not really too, too much to worry about but it it's, uh, has a, a little bit of an effect but it's the only way to actually be able to use a really fast shutter speed on say uh, a, a river a, or a river scene taken on an overcast day but you can do it okay going to go back to the sea again in a moment and the effects really of using different shutter speeds, different exposure times, and slightly different lighting as well on, 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 uh, well, on in this instance, on the same, more or less the same view. The image on the left is taken a few minutes before sunset. You can see the sun is shining in from the right. You've got strong shadows here. And I've used a, uh, an exposure time, which is uh, four seconds F, and with the lens aperture f18. So the lens aperture is closed right down, so you'd have a big depth of field, or actually there's nothing much behind the rock except water. But the four, the four seconds has had an interesting effect on the water. In the background, the water is blurred-ish, but you can still see the individual waves and, or ripples on the water surface. In the foreground, it's much more blurred. Of course, that's because the water here, actually on the shore, 
is moving much faster, relatively speaking, than the water further out. Relatively close to me, and as, it's, as the waves are rushing up the beach, so they're actually a lot more blurred, that's blurring out. But so it's a kind of a, a mixed effect. The, wave, the uh, ripples out, out here are still clearly visible. Here, the, the rushing water is a lot more blurred. The image on the right it was taken about half an hour or so after sunset. You see the light on the rock is a lot softer. And uh, I, I've used a much longer exposure time. It's 25 seconds. Uh, and F16, so still a narrow lens after giving me a big depth of field. And uh, you see, the 25 seconds has had the effect of blurring everything out in the water. The water completely blurred out, so it's become silky smooth and become sort of very calming and peaceful, quite sort of ethereal in many ways. And um, this picture on the right used an ND graduated filter to darken the sky. And plus also an, N, an ND neutral density filter to darken everything as well to lengthen my exposure time. Well, obviously, 30 minutes or so after sunset, the light levels are getting quite low, but to nevertheless, to be able to use a long exposure time of 25 seconds with the lens aperture closed right down at f16, it's uh, never still had to use uh, uh, an ND filter to, to make that slow exposure possible. Okay. So the next shot is a similar kind of idea, using a very slow exposure to really blur the water out completely. It's just 13 seconds taken at dawn, sometime a little, maybe 20 minutes or so before the sun came up. And I'm just using this picture to illustrate the fact that you can shoot something very simple, and well, as with the last picture, something very simple, which is a fairly attractive rock in the last image. Here, the two rocks are not particularly attractive in themselves, but in this kind of image with uh, really blurred out water, various ethereal you've seen, the whole thing becomes quite atmospheric. And you can use water blurred out in this way to actually isolate your subject. All the, what we might call the negative space, that is everything in the image that is not the main subject, just literally quite literally disappears because it's just blurred out in this silky smooth ethereal scene, which uh, just means that there's nothing competing for attention. It's just these two rocks juxtaposed against each other. And that creates the sort of the, the subject matter, and the and and the blurred out water creates the atmosphere and the mood. A little bit dark, a little bit blue, uh, blue, blue because it's uh, the sun is still below the horizon, and so there's only reflected light available, which is always rich in blue and very poor in red. And a little bit dark, I've deliberately left it a little bit dark because in order to to put in that kind of mood, that kind of somber mood. It's something kind of similar in terms of idea, but taken just at dawn again, but just before the sun came up on a very bright dawn um, uh, dawn morning, on a very bright dawn, uh, a little bit busier than the previous shot, rather complicated with a lot more rocks, but nevertheless having the same effect with the water completely blurred out and just really simplifying the image, or simplifying certainly in terms of the water that's moving around, no ripples visible, no waves, just this nice, silky smooth, ethereal, seen uh, just 13 second exposure and it's f upon 11 so the lens aperture is fairly narrow so we've got quite a nice big depth of field it's sharp all the way from the rocks in the foreground all the way to the rocks and even the horizon in the in, in the distance as well so everything's sharp well everything that's stationary is sharp i should say so the rocks and then the water is beautifully blurred out with a 13 second exposure uh, I think actually I use only a neutral density graduated filter on this picture, not a completely neutral density filter. So, that, so I managed to get a slow enough shutter speed uh, despite the brightness of that sky there. Moving on to something well, still sim quite similar. This is taken at dusk. Most of the time when you do this kind of shot, you want to, you're going to want be hoping to do it in, in reasonably nice weather when you've got nice sort of light in the sky. A little bit of blue, a little bit of orange and red, and uh, so you've got orange and red in the sky. The, the, the rocks and the water, rocks themselves are a little bit blue. The light on the on the rocks is blue because the sun is below the horizon again, and uh, obviously, I say reflected light is rich in blue. There's not much red coming onto the rocks. It's the red is just in the sky, receiving the last of the of the direct light from the sun that's now below the horizon. So here, this exposure is 20 seconds at. Uh, F, F11. So again, the 
20 seconds is it completely blurred out the water it gave you a, a very calming ethereal sort of atmosphere no sense of agitation it's just very smooth they say this is taken in, in nice weather it's a sort of weather that you would always prefer to take pictures in if you if you possibly can or it's more most inviting anyway but nevertheless you can still get some great shots when it's really overcast and this was on a very uh, gray dull day uh, still taken uh, sometime after sunset with six, a six second exposure f upon 18 so he's a really big depth of field to uh, to get everything sharp here and you can see that the, the the water is really blurred out, even though six seconds is not particularly long. Earlier we had four seconds where the where ripples were still still visible. Here, six seconds, it's completely blurred out. Again, very blue because uh, the sun is below the horizon. And also because there's so much cloud cover as well, it's just bouncing the light around. There's no direct light, which would might be uh, have more red in it. It's, the blue is, is, is quite strong. So, yeah, so a little bit of... Visibility, you can, in the water in the foreground, you can see a little bit of uh, movement here with, with, with water uh, swishing around the rocks, but mostly the water is completely blurred out. So those previous shots are all taken by a bit dawn or dusk when light levels are low. And of course, you don't need to use an en a neutral density filter very often. As I've already said, in daylight, you very often do need to use a net neutral density filter simply because there's just too much light around to be able to get, get a slow enough shutter speed. However, on really gloomy, stormy days in autumn and winter, uh, so very often, or sometimes anyway, you can get really light levels that are so low that you could get a good blurring even without any kind of neutral density filter. So this is a shot on the north coast of Devon. Shutter speed is two seconds. Lens aperture is f22, so we've got a big depth of field. So two seconds has, has been enough to blur out the water in many ways, but also, but but fast enough to actually still be able to give us some sense of movement and agitation in the waves, both right in the foreground here and in the background where you've got bigger waves breaking. So we've got really some sense, not not this complete blur out, to create this smooth ethereal silky view. Here we have a little bit of agitation with with the waves being a little um, a little bit uh, clearer, you might say. This is taken, say, with no ND filter in the middle of the middle of the afternoon on a, on a fairly stormy and very dull day. Contrast this one with with this much closer dropped shot, just a detail shot. Um, just homing in on the rocks and the, and the surf uh, swirling around the rocks. This is 1.3 seconds, so I, I use a faster shutter speed, so the water is not completely blurred out. We've got this sense, really the sense of the waves swirling around the rocks, and you really have this feeling of agitation and energy, and, 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 and it's really active and lively. It's definitely not uh, a silky, smooth, ethereal, misty view on, on, on this occasion. This is just a really active, energetic uh, wave. I've used f22 on the lens, a telephoto lens, obviously, uh, 1.3 seconds exposure. And this was uh, the sort of the slowest exposure time I could get without having to use a neutral density filter. So there's no ND filter on this. This is just just the, just the camera uh, on, a, on a, uh, a fairly overcast day. So uh, they're able to get 1.3 seconds because it's so overcast to actually give us a really agitated blur in this moving water. Similarly, kind of, similar kind of thing, moving inland with uh, fast moving streams, uh, using a sort of shutter speed of just 0 0.6 seconds because the water is moving so fast. You don't have to use too slow a shutter speed to, to blur out the moving water. But 0 0.6 seconds is enough to give us uh, a blur, to give us a sense of energy and movement and dynamism, but fast enough to actually retain the idea of, 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 and the shape of the the waves, if you like, the movement of the water and the agitation of the water, giving us a very agitated scene in, in, in this water. And um, again, it's taken on an overcast day. Photography in woodland is always better done without the sunlight because you don't get bright highlights and deep shadows, which you do on sunny days. So light levels are reasonably low, which enables me to use this, um, this slowish shutter speed of 0.6 seconds, F22. 
that's the uh, 0.6 is the slowest shutter speed I could get without using an ND filter. And uh, so just because you've got low, low bad light levels doesn't mean that you can't take great photographs. You just need to be able to photograph the, uh, the right kind of subject matter. Just choose your subject matter according to uh, the weather, you might say. Similar kind of idea. Um, again, on an overcast day in Woodland, the River Dart on Dartmoor. Um, first thing to, to note is, say, when you're looking at static water, you really does you really can't see any movement. You use a nice, as slow a shutter speed as you like. You actually don't get any any blur on water that's moving very very slowly. It's only when you actually get to the fast moving stuff, such as this, where it pours over the waterfall here, that you get the sense of uh, of get you get the blur and really get the sense of movement and dynamism. And energy, is, as I say. So this is a 0 0.5 for half a second exposure, f22 again. Um, so again, this is uh, the slowest shutter speed I could get without using an ND filter. And I think the blur is actually almost perfect for this kind of scene. It's, it, we, can still, we can see the water moving over the, over the lip of the little waterfall very clearly. We actually really get the sense of moving water. It's not completely blurred out. And again, actually also, with, as with the previous image, the fact that it's not taken on a sunny day, the fact that it's taken on a, on a cloudy day is really a big advantage, not just so that it enables me to give a slow shutter speed, but also so that I don't get this white water burning out. This is always the problem with fast moving uh, rivers, streams, moorland streams and so on. That if it's sunny, the, this white water you get from the water pouring over rocks just completely blur, uh, burns out and becomes a really difficult thing to, to handle and just can really mess up the picture. So overcast day, with a nice slow shutter speed, really will blur out the moving water nicely. Okay, so the final part of this talk looks at waterfalls. Can ever go um, very far in landscape photography and the landscape photography of water anyway without talking about waterfalls. Um, not surprisingly, the water coming over a waterfall is moving pretty darn fast. And, and the bigger the waterfall, the higher the waterfall, and the more, greater the volume of water coming over it, the faster that water was moving. So this has become a, a, a real challenge to, to use shutter speeds that are fast enough to freeze the movement of the water. Obviously, in bright sunlight, you could do that. But then all that white water pouring down over the, over the waterfall, will it will be in serious danger of burning out. And uh, so it, very often, the, the uh, simplest technical um, route is to just stick your camera on a tripod, photograph in uh, cloudy weather, and just use a nice slow exposure time and just blur out the water into this really nice silken or series of silken ribbons in this in this picture. And um, this particular shot, eighth of a second, so it's really quite a fast shutter speed, really, by the standards of some of the pictures I've shown you so far this evening. And yet we're still getting a quite a, a major blur, which really gives us an indication just just how fast that water is moving. Uh, lens aperture is f22, so we're getting a big depth of field, so everything is sharp, really, from right in right in front of me all the way through to the waterfall in the background. So this is a waterfall kind of where I'm looking side onto it. So we've got uh, areas that are very close to me and uh, areas that are much further away. So I'm looking onto the front of the waterfall like you were very off are, off are with most waterfalls. This is a sort of a side on view. So I need a big depth of field to get it all sharp. But that of course works in my favor because it uh, then uh, gives me a nice blur. Nice sort of um, what I call shards of glass here which show the spray bouncing off the rock. But most of the time the water was really quite well blurred out in this image. Uh, that last image was shot in Iceland. This is also in Iceland, it's a great place for waterfalls. This is a uh, Sally Landsfoss, which is a very much visited place on, near the south coast of Iceland. And you can see it's a huge waterfall in terms of height and in terms of volume of water coming over. And um, it's very easy to blur, the, blur out the, the falling water. In fact, it's, very, it's moving so fast it's quite difficult not to. Uh, the, the challenge in this particular shot is that although the waterfall is in shadow and the, and the cliff face behind it, most of the landscape is in quite bright sunlight. So we've really got this challenge of actually trying to balance up the, the shadow area and the sunlit area. So what I've done here is use a, a neutral density, an ND grad filter, neutral, neutral density graduated filter with the transition line between dark and clear running along the cliff edge. So this area, the sky area, and much of, much of the landscape is greatly darkened, and this area is rather lightened. 
I then have, have to say did a little bit more work in post photography in the computer as well to lighten this cliff area a little bit more to actually help balance up the picture a little bit better. But uh, again, the waterfall itself is in shadow, so the light, amount of light falling on the on the water is is quite low. So slow shutter speeds. This was an, an eighth of a second again. Oh no, I'm looking at the wrong thing. A sixth of a second. A sixth of a second. So a little bit slower than the previous image, but uh, not, not not a great deal. F upon 22 to give me a huge depth of field and also, of course, make maximize the uh, the exposure time as well. I haven't used an overall neutral density filter, just a neutral density gradually coming down this side of the picture here. And uh, you can see just it's really massively blurred out because it gives you a good indication that even at a sixth of a second it's blurring out this much. It really indicates that it is moving at quite a speed. Now I do sometimes uh, you photograph waterfalls actually with with the sun visible in the picture. And here we have a shot on the North Devon coast. The waterfall faces northwards. And so this is an early morning shot with the sun just moving around, just about to disappear from view behind the cliff. So the waterfall is now in, in shadow. If I'd arrived half an hour earlier, it probably would have been in sunlight. But uh, moving um, a little bit further into the morning, the waterfall is in, is in shadow, but the sun is still just peeping around the edge of the cliff and really uh, lighting up the, the sky and, and the water. With the, the water, the waterfall itself still in shadow. So, as with the previous picture, I use a neutral density graduated filter with a with a transition zone from the, on the filter running down the line of the cliff, darkening the sky and the sea and some of the pebbles as well at the bottom, and making this whole this whole thing more or less um, balanced. A little bit of work needed to actually lighten the cliff here, but not a, not a great deal actually. It balanced up reasonably well. But in terms of the shutter speed, it's a small waterfall. It's uh, f22 again to get a big depth of field and also maximize the exposure time. It's 0 0.3 seconds, so it's, it's a good bit, good bit slower than the previous two images. And you can see it's not blurring out quite as much. You can see we've got, what well, I say, the shards of glass or the spray coming down onto the onto the rocks here and then dripping here as well. So it's this water waterfall is not moving quite as fast as the uh, previous couple of shots. Uh, not surprisingly, because it's a much smaller waterfall with much less water coming over the cliff. But then we move on and we come into something where there is lots of sunlight, lots of sunshine. So how do we cope here? Well, for one thing, the sun is actually not shining on the front of the waterfall. It's uh, actually top left up here, just behind the waterfall. So most of the front of the waterfall itself is actually in shadow. So that saves me from having huge amounts of uh, white water burning out. There is some here, which is pretty bright. And then the water in the river in front of the waterfall is getting pretty bright. I don't think it's quite burned out, but it's getting pretty close. But the water in the waterfall itself is in shadow. So that saves it from just massively burning out, which is a big help for me. But nevertheless, there is overall a lot of light available. So I'm able to use a, quite a fast shutter speed with, uh, without too much difficulty. So uh, I've used four thousandths of a second, which obviously is incredibly fast. And it's been also because I'm actually very close to the one edge of the waterfall. So to freeze this move, this, this part of the waterfall here, we'd have to use a very, very fast shutter speed because it is so close to the camera. So four thousandths of a second, lens aperture is f5. So the lens aperture is wide open uh, in order to try and get that four thousandths of a second. And I've had to increase the ISO to 400 in order to make that possible as well. 400, don't worry about it. It's, it doesn't really affect the, uh, the grainy quality, grain quality of the picture at all. So that's fine. The F5 does worry me a bit in landscape photography because you get a much smaller depth of field, so much less of the picture is uh, is sharp. Although obviously this picture is taken with a wide angle lens, 27 millimeter. My notes say here, so wide, not hugely wide, but wide enough. But you can see in the background here, the trees and the water back here are starting to blur out a little bit, but that's okay. That's, it still gives me quite a big depth of field across most of the waterfall and a fast shutter speed, fast, fast, fast shutter speed, which has frozen most of the movement of the water. So there's a little bit of a little bit of blur here and there in a few places, but we've captured water droplets flying through the air and so on, and it's really come out quite effectively. For the next shot, homes in very close on that, bit of water that's right cl right close to me, right on the edge of the waterfall. 
And here I've used the last shot was used a 27 millimeter lens. This is a 200 millimeter lens. So I've really honed in on just this one small part of the waterfall that's in shadow. Obviously, with a telephoto lens, your depth of field is much smaller, so you can see the background of the waterfall is, is completely blurred. And you see that we've done reasonably well in, in freezing the movement of most of the water here. Down here, the water droplets are starting to blur out a little bit, uh, partly because of depth of field, partly perhaps the water the shutter speed is not quite fast enough. It is four thousandths of a second again, same as the previous shot, and again f5 and uh, 400, ISO 400. So the settings are all the same, it's just because we're using a telephoto lens now we're coming in much closer. So the relative speed of the water here is, is faster because it's traveling across a much bigger proportion of the of the image frame than it is in the wide angle view. So it's harder to, to freeze up to move, move into the water and the depth of field is greatly reduced as well because of the using the telephoto lens. Okay, so final sort of comparison shots. Here we have uh, waterfall on the north coast of Devon, uh, very looking rather brown, unfortunately, it was taken after some heavy rain. But using a fast shutter speed, it's an overcast day. And the waterfall is actually in deep shadow in a, in a, in a gorge anyway. I used two, uh, 2,500 of a second, with f upon four, so the lens aperture is wide open, so minimal depth of field. But that doesn't matter too much because I'm looking straight onto the waterfall, so that most of the water is actually at the same distance from me. I've had to put the ISO up to 800, so starting to get fairly high, starting to look perhaps a little bit grainy, but I don't think the shutter speed is quite fast enough. On this, it's frozen the water reasonably well. We've got some good water droplets, but here you can see it's not quite as sharp as perhaps I might like it to be. Over here, it's quite well frozen, but not too bad. But it's quite, I think it's quite a messy picture. It's quite hard to see what's going on, I have to say. So and that's the result of the fast shutter speed freezing the movement of the water. It's a little bit chaotic. If you slow things down, you come up with this shot, exactly the same frame, exactly the same view, exactly the same composition. And now you can actually see what's going on in the waterfall much more clearly. This is with the ISO back down at 100. Lens aperture has gone up to f22, so really narrow, and that's giving me a shutter speed of, of an eighth of a second. So nice, nice slow, Shutter speed, long exposure, with the water moving really fast, it's it's enough to give me quite a good blur, <clears throat> but but fast enough that I'm still getting what I say these shards of glass, these flying remnants of water, areas of water. So not completely blurred out. I have to use a significantly slower shutter speed, uh, probably two or three seconds or something like that, to actually completely blur out the movement of the water into a nice silken sheet. But I think this is actually much more effective as a sort of a very agitated and almost angry, not actually angry, but a very agitated and dynamic kind of shot where you can see the, the water flying in all directions here. This is an sort of eighth of a second, I think is probably the slowest shutter speed I could get without using an ND filter. And uh, I didn't use an ND filter to do this shot, but it would have been interesting perhaps to do so to just see how, how different a blur I would have got. Okay, so that's the last image. At the end, it's just the usual thing. Um, firstly, about my spring workshops, they've now started. The, last, uh, the first one, I should say, was last Sunday, uh, the low-light photography workshop in Exmouth. Weather didn't cooperate terribly well, but we, got, we managed to do a few interesting things. So the next workshop is the 27th of April, which is Atlantic Coast, up on the north coast of Devon, around Heartland Quay, or in Heartland anyway, but welcome mouth waterfall there. and. Uh, and Heartland Key, and then the 11th of May, which will be uh, on, in the Mendip Hills, and hopefully on the sunset levels as well. And then, uh, well, obviously, uh, another reminder about my Wild West Cornwall Photography Tour in November, which should be some great awesome coastal, Atlantic coastal photography. Um, but two, two spaces still on that tour, so if anybody's thinking of coming on, please let me know. It'd be great to hear from you. And then finally, the next talk is on 19th of June, and then uh, I'm just posing the question, is summer photography a waste of time? The question popped up into my head because uh, I've heard this a number of times down the years that people just put their camera away in the middle of summer because the sky's too blue, the grass is too green, the sun's too high, there are far too many people on the road and too, also too many people getting in the way of the views. So that which, of course, there is something to be said for all that, but is that really a good reason to give up altogether? I'm going to talk about that, I hope. 
um, in uh, in June. So that's kind of it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And so if anybody wants to ask any questions, please fire away. Obviously, turn your microphone on if you want to ask a question. Um, you're welcome to turn your camera on as well if, if you want to, but if you do, of course, you will be visible in the in the recording that will go onto YouTube later. So um, you may may or may not be want, want that. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. All right, so there we are. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a whistle stop tour of uh, photography of fast moving water. Uh, um, any questions? Anybody got any questions? If not, then uh, we'll sort of uh, close it down for the evening. Okay. All right. Well, that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk, and hope it's uh, it's uh, uh, it was um, it's sort of uh, useful as well, and it's uh, you. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you very much, Nigel. Okay, you're very welcome, Alistair. Thanks for. Thanks really for enjoyed it. Good. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to if let's let's a, a question, then we'll just uh, I'll just end end the talk. I'll sign off and end the talk, and I'll see you. Uh, Again soon, I hope. Thank you very See much. You. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.